So I have decided to watch a few of the Ancient Alien series on TV lately, and I must say that I am not extremely impressed with what they are doing on TV. They know that the average public likes drama, and so what they're doing basically is they're putting information out there that is not correct, uh, that is not well researched. And I'm actually very uh, much less impressed with those participating in this whole everything is an alien stance. So all of the people, all of these so-called experts that they are bringing on their show that are participating in this whole everything is an alien stance, I'm very um, disappointed with. Because any of these guys that are supposed to be really good researchers, um, any guys that go out and really do research, there are plenty of articles that you can find in universities uh, that perform deep studies on these issues. Uh, if you take a look at symbolism and you compare it across culture, you can see that these guys have the opportunity, they have the ability to go out there and look at this stuff and come to better conclusions than they are. But because they know that drama sells, they are participating in this whole everything is an alien stance. And so I'm very disappointed with uh, ancient aliens, but it's a simple business equation. If ancient aliens does not point out to you that everything could possibly be an alien, then the show goes off air. It's that simple. Because they have put themselves in a position where they must determine that everything that you see out there is an alien. And that's the reason why we see so many jokes regarding this guy with the hair uh, that says, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. And the reason why we see so many jokes about that guy out there is because if ancient aliens did not do this, they would go off air. If they start putting out the truth, they would go off air. So it all comes down to money again, folks. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm actually going to play some of the Ancient Aliens debunk series. It only, it's only going to pertain to the Assyrian Sacred Tree or the Assyrian Tree of Life. And the Assyrian Tree of Life, according to the Journal of Near Eastern Studies, is exactly what it is. And this is exactly what I've been showing you for quite some time. So let's play some of this Ancient Aliens debunk stuff so you can kind of see where Ancient Aliens is doing versus what I'm going to present to you from real research. In the ancient texts of Sumeria, we have descriptions of these beings descending from the sky called the Anunnaki. The term Anunnaki means those who from the heavens came. This is entirely wrong. The word Anunnaki means princely seed or princely blood. The idea is that the Anunnaki were direct creations of Anu, who was regarded as the father and king of the gods. As we will see, this is the main idea associated with the Anunnaki in the minds of the Sumerians. That is, that the Anunnaki were directly created by Anu. And so it makes sense that even their name reflects this idea. That is, that they were the offspring of the prince. The term itself means of royal seed or princely seed, because the Anunnaki were considered the offspring of Anu or An, uh, the great god of heaven. And also we have, again, Anunnaki. They were also the offspring of An and his consort, Ki, the heaven and earth. Uh, these, again, this divine coupling, the way the Mesopotamians conceived uh, their pantheon. So if the term Anunnaki means princely seed or offspring of the prince, how is it that ancient aliens says that the word Anunnaki means those who from heaven to earth came? The short answer is that everything that ancient aliens says here about the Anunnaki comes from a man named Zachariah Sitchin. Sitchin wrote many books claiming that the Anunnaki were really aliens. Unfortunately, at the time that he wrote this, in the 70s, there weren't many ways for ordinary people to see if what he was saying was true or not. To put it simply, Sitchin's translation of the word Anunnaki is wrong. Now you'll often read, especially in the writings of Zechariah Sitchin, that the Anunnaki means something like, you know, they who from heaven came, or again, some, some other sort of description that makes them sound like aliens or extraterrestrials. Uh, there isn't a source on the planet by any Sumerian scholar uh, that would agree with that definition. Again, it's not a difficult term. Uh, I personally don't think that Sitchin knew Sumerian at all, because if you're going to get even 
a term associated with a very important group of deities. If you're not going to get that right, then I have to wonder what else you're going to get wrong. To this day, I haven't been able to find, nor have other people whom I've asked to help, uh, people who like Sitchin, I've never been able to find any actual credentials uh, of him knowing any of the languages or being credentialed in any way in ancient Near Eastern studies. The idea that the texts say that they descended out of flying vehicles is pure fiction, and that's the nicest way that I can think of to say that. What Ancient Aliens does here is they show pictures of the winged solar disk as they talk about the Anunnaki, and I guess they expect the audience to think that these texts speak of these disks like spacecraft in the Sumerian stories. And they were always described or depicted in floating above some quote-unquote regular people. Since the Anunnaki are never depicted floating above people's heads, we can see that they want people to believe that the solar disk icon equals the Anunnaki spacecraft. This is wrong for several reasons. Number one, the solar disks in the Sumerian culture really did represent the sun or the sun god. You need to know that there is nothing in these descriptions of the sun in the Sumerian texts that would suggest that they were really talking about a UFO. The idea that ancient aliens proposes here, that the Anunnaki actually came out of the solar disks, or that they were pictured riding in them, is just a lie. There's no way around it. We can find not only descriptions of the Anunnaki, but also depictions. And we can see them in statues, in carvings. So it's all very interesting to see that those beings looked like modern day space travelers with weird suits. Some of them wore wrist watches, they had boots on, and helmets, and above all, wings. One way to demonstrate this is by explaining what Ancient Aliens calls a wristwatch. First, you should take note that if this is a watch, then these genies were serious about timekeeping, because they wore one of these on both wrists and often on a headband as well. This watch is actually an Akkadian symbol for Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. So I can tell you this, frankly, uh, if ancient aliens were to ever ask me on their show to participate in this whole craziness about everything could be an alien, uh, you can count me out. Now Magical Egypt, uh, with John Anthony West and these guys presenting um, things from real researchers like R.A. Schwaller de Lubitsch and stuff like that, yes, I will be on a show like that. But this stuff with the ancient alien stuff, I would never get on a show like that simply because I don't want to ruin my reputation as far as the truth goes. You know, I'm not here to put out information because I think it sells or because I think it's dramatic. If I wanted to do that, I could have taken the information that I have and run with it and turned it into a huge alien story a long time ago. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, this particular video is going to be covering the... Assyrian Tree of Life, and the Assyrian Sacred Tree. And if you noticed, I have shown you uh, some images regarding this, which we will go over in this video, that is showing you that the tree that they're presenting to us is related to the human body. And it has to do with the tree of life that is inside the human body. The winged globe, or the winged disc, although one representation, when we think about it in the macrocosm, has to do with the sun god, not our local sun, because the ancients did not believe that our local sun was anything more than a glowing sphere that received power from the actual sun god, which we will see later. But uh, if we think of it in the macrocosm, that's what it represents. It represents something regarding the macrocosm. On the microcosm level, it represents man, and the winged globe is actually the head. So. This right here we see the University of Chicago Press and it is the Journal of Near Eastern Studies. So let's take a look at what they have to say. The Assyrian Tree of Life, Tracing the Origins of Jewish Monotheism and Greek Philosophy. A stylized tree with obvious religious significance already occurs as an art motif in 4th millennium Mesopotamia and by the 2nd millennium BC it is found everywhere within the orbit of the ancient Near Eastern Okemi including Egypt, Greece, and the end of civilization. The meaning of the motif is not clear, but its overall composition strikingly recalls the tree of life of later Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and Buddhist art. The question of whether the concept of the tree of life actually existed in ancient Mesopotamia 
has been debated, however, and thus many scholars today prefer the more neutral term sacred tree when referring to the Mesopotamian tree. Now what we will see is the Journal of Near Eastern Studies has made the same connection that I have to, for, say for example, the Kabbalist Tree of Life. The only thing that they have not done that I have noticed is, is they have not proceeded further and checked the actual geometry. Because when we look at the geometry of the ancient Mesopotamians and we take a look at the geometry of the Egyptians, we'll see that there is a strikingly computer precision type uh, similarity between the two when we're going to take a look at the Assyrian tree versus what we see, for example, on the Temple of Luxor, which Ari Swaller de Lubitsch studied. What they have done here is they've made the same connection. What they have not done is they have not actually taken a look at the geometry associated with the flower of life and with the Kabbalistic tree of life, which we will see later on. Essentially, it consists of a trunk with a palmic crown standing on a stone base and surrounded by a network of horizontal or intersecting lines fringed with palmettes, pine cones, and pomegranates. And what we're going to see about these particular pine cones or what have you is that the uh, what they're doing is they're showing things at certain vertical levels on the tree. So when they show the pine cone, the pine cone is also a representation of the pineal gland. This goes back a long ways. But if you notice on the tree that what we're going to be showing you, they're showing it at a certain level. Because that level on the tree has to do with the human body and it has to do with area of the human body. We're going to see that at a certain level they hold a staff on the tree and that staff is the same level as the heart. And then at another level, higher up on the tree, they hold the pine cone. And that has to do with the pineal gland area. It has to do with the area of the head. The basic symbolism of the tree. What did this tree stand for and why was it chosen as an imperial symbol? There is considerable literature on this question, but despite the most painstaking analysis of the, of the iconographic evidence, on the whole, little has been explained. This is largely due uh, to the almost lack of relevant textual evidence. The symbolism of the tree is not discussed in the cuneiform sources, and few references to sacred trees or plants in Mesopotamian literature have proved too vague or obscure to be productive. Now, when you take a look at the tree and the symbolism, you'll find that this same symbolism occurs across culture. You're going to find many versions of this same tree. What I have noticed personally with the Assyrian tree and the geometry associated with it is by this point they had come to a realization of the geometry and the perfection of the geometry with inside the tree. This is what the textual uh, evidence cannot give you. There is no scripture or textual evidence that they found, and so because they didn't check the geometry, because they didn't look at the symbolism and find the similarities across culture, it's remained vague. What we're going to prove in this is that it is associated with a human body, and if you take a look at the symbolism associated with it, and compared to Egyptian, for example, it becomes very clear that it's associated with the human body and the spinal cord, and we'll actually see that as we go on. Okay, so right here we're looking at the version of the tree, the Assyrian tree, and this is the actual Assyrian tree that we're going to be talking about. Now, right here in the second paragraph it says, Secondly, it was observed some time ago that in some reliefs the king takes the place of the tree between the Huing genies. Whatever the precise implications of this fact, it is evident that in such scenes the king is portrayed as the human personification of the tree. This is also exactly what I have found is that the tree is a personification of a human. We'll see that when we explore the geometry more. It also says here that clearly the tree here represents the divine world order. And sorry I have to say this, but that is not to be confused with the new world order for all of you people out there. Uh, down here they have a, a footnote for divine world order and that takes us down to 29. And we can see where it is the design, it refers to the organization of the divine and the material world by Marduk. And Marduk is the same as Asar, and the same as Asari. Asar is actually the Egyptian god Osiris, and we'll see why that makes sense. So let's hop on over to another uh, renowned researcher, E.A. Wallace Budge, in his book called From Fetish to God in Ancient Egypt. And we're just going to hop over here for a second and get an understanding of Marduk. He says, we may now compare the cuneiform characters for Asari, that is Marduk, and the transcription of them into hieroglyphs. 
the group of wedges, which are read Asari, is, and it is composed of two distinct characters. The first has the well-known meaning of tent, or dwelling, or resting place. The second has the meaning of I, and is placed inside the sign for tent. The two signs by which these are transcribed in Egyptian are a seat, or a throne, and an I. Now the sign is followed in the text by two other cuneiform characters. These form a title of Asari, and are read in Sumerian, Ludug, and they mean good man or being. Thus we have Asari, the good being, but we find in the Egyptian texts that one of the principal titles of Osiris is Unefer, that is, good being, and it seems clear that this title is the Egyptian translation of the cuneiform, thus there is little doubt that the Egyptian Asar, which is Osiris, is the equivalent of the Babylonian Asari. Now if we take a look in the pyramid text, utterance 442, we can clearly see the association of Osiris to Orion. It says here, Lo, Osiris has come as Orion. And that is in utterance 442. So when we're thinking of the macrocosm, we think of Orion. When we think of the microcosm, we think of man. And with that information, let's hop back over to our Journal of Near Eastern Studies. So here is where we find the Journal of Near Eastern Studies in confirmation with the information that I have been showing you. And that is the Sephirotic tree. The Mesopotamian esoteric lore has a remarkable parallel in Jewish Kabbalah. And more importantly, from the standpoint of the present topic, so does the Assyrian tree. And on the next page, we can actually see that they are showing the same kind of information that I've been showing you associated with the Assyrian tree. The only thing they have not done that I have noticed in this particular article is they have not applied, other than seeing the similarities, they have not applied the actual geometry to the tree, which we will do in this presentation. Now here they reference the macrocosm and the microcosm, which is what I've been showing you using the uh, Kabbalah tree of life and also the Assyrian tree as well. These are two things that I've shown you and I've actually shown you how the macrocosm ties into this. Remember, the macrocosm is the same as Orion. Osiris has come as Orion. Osiris is the same as Asar, and Asar is the same as Marduk, and we have this divine world order which actually refers to the emanation of this god Osiris, or the macrocosm, all the way down into the material world. This is the same viewpoint that we get from the Kabbal uh, Kabbalah tree of life, and so what we see here is the macrocosm. This is on one hand, it is a picture of the macrocosm that gives an account of the creation of the world, accompanied in three successive stages by the Sephirot emanating from the transcendent God. It also charts the cosmic harmony of the universe upheld by the Sephirot under the straining influence of the polar systems of opposites. And here we go. On the other hand, the Sephirothic tree, like the Assyrian, can also refer to man as the microcosm, the ideal man created in the image of God. This is what I have shown you, and what we're going to do is we're going to apply the geometry here now to the Assyrian tree of life. And we're going to use the flower of life, and we're going to use the Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah tree of life, and we're going to see how they both fit in. This is what this article has not done, is apply this actual geometry. Then we're also going to associate that to the uh, what we see on the Temple of Luxor, for example. And then we're going to finish off with the meaning of the winged disc at the very top. Now, right here in this journal, we can see that they're comparing uh, various trees of life uh, to what we see as far as the Kabbalah tree of life that we see down here and the various Mesopotamian trees. So they've made the same connections that I have made here. Here on the upper right, they show Kether as actually being in the head. And this is important. This is what we're going to see when we take a look at the geometry of the uh, Kabbalah tree of life on top of the Assyrian tree. Here they point out the very many different versions that you may have seen of the Assyrian tree of life, which is not always Assyria. Uh, some of the times it's Sumerian, sometimes it's others, um, but you can see the different versions of them and there's many of them. And here are the different versions you may have seen of the winged disc. These are all th also things and similarities that I have pointed out as well across culture. Uh, the Sumerian winged disc is also the same as the Assyrian winged disc, and they're all pointing to the same thing. 
Lastly, I want to point not point out in this article that they show the four-letter tetragrammaton, and as you see, they have it stacked like the figure of a man. This is the representation, or another representation, of the macrocosm and the microcosm. So at the top we have Yod, then we have He, then we have Vav, and then we have He, and this is the same thing as uh, many of you are familiar with, Yahweh. And the four-letter four tetragrammaton is a representation of the macrocosm and the microcosm. Uh, the Hebrew letters are also can be used as symbols. And so we see right here that this represents the four worlds, starting from the emanation, which is here at Keter, and moving down into the material world. Now here is where we're going to explore the geometry. Many of you are familiar with the flower of life. Well, this is taken one step further as far as the complexity goes. And the reason why we use this one is because this shows us all kinds of information. I've always said it, and I'm still going to say it now. The geometry and the symbolism that you see on the temples uh, and in this various art, and it doesn't matter whether you go from the art all the way back into ancient times, or if you take a look at the art inside cathedrals, it tells you the real story. All the textual versions that you see, the variations of these various texts, they are always described at the level of the allegory, and that's the reason why they never agree with each other perfectly. The symbolism, however, is a different story. We can easily see the similarities across culture when we take a look at this stuff. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see that in this particular Assyrian tree that they really have used sacred geometry or the flower of life geometry inside uh, their tree of life. Okay, so let's take a look at something here. The last thing we looked at in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies was the yod he vav he which represents the four-letter tetragrammaton, the macrocosm and the microcosm, which is man, an emanation that starts at Yod, which is Kether, and moves down the tree of life. What we have here is the uh, flower of life in its more complex version. And what you're going to notice is, is that we have four vesica Pisces stacked on top of each other. One down here, one here, one here, and one at the very top. And that will represent our four worlds. The geometry is being used here, so if we take a look at yod he vav he we can see that it's stacked this way. This is the way the human body will actually fit on top of the tree of life. So when we apply our human body form on top of this, then we'll see exactly how the human body is supposed to fit on here there is an MRI image of a human body. The area that is measured is measured from the very tip of the sacrum, which is located right where I have my mouse, all the way up to right here. If you'll notice, that is the very center of the vesica Pisces on the lower side, and the very center of the vesica Pisces on the higher side. This is where the pineal gland is located, and right here is the very tip of the sacrum. And this is how the ancients measured the tree of life. So once again, if we take a look at the human body on top of the flower of life, right here we have the tick of the tip of the sacrum. Right in the very middle of the flower of life we see the heart. And at the very top we see the pineal gland area. Uh, the very top vesica Pisces is reserved for the head. Uh, this area right here is reserved for the shoulders, the top shoulders and arms. This area refers to the stomach area. This area here refers to uh, the pelvis area and the bottom of the sacrum. So we have the head and we have the rest which is associated to the body. Now if we take a look at the Kabbalistic Tree of Life on top of this, just like we saw inside the article for the Journal of Near Eastern Studies, we can see that the Tree of Life is fashioned this way, with Kether being in the head. and that represents the Trinity, the top three. Below the top three, which is the Trinity, we have the rest of the body that moves all the way down to Malkuth. If we take the body scan off, we can see the geometry of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life that fits in there perfectly into the Flower of Life. So let's take a close-up look of the Tree of Life inside the Flower of Life here. The top, if you'll notice, Kether, with these spikes around the top of it, uh, fits right inside the circle that you see here. And each one of these sephirots 
you can see fits in the middle of each one of these circles that you see. And all this geometry that you see within here, they're fitting right inside the circles here. The sun, which is the very center, beauty, that represents the heart. And in the macrocosm, it also represents the sun that is our local sun. Our local sun in the macrocosm represents the heart of the larger macrocosmic system. The brain of the larger microcosm system is not our sun. So the solar disk that you see at the very top is not our local sun, but it is something different. But it's actually associated to Orion, and we'll see that later on. Down here, right where you see this X, this is where the tip of the sacrum is. And you can see how this follows also the line of the sacrum, because this is meant to be used as something that we put the human body on top of. So if we put the human body on top of it again, we can see how it fits from sacrum, coccyx area, to the heart. And we think of macrocosm, and we think of our sun and our local solar system. And then the very top, which represents the crown, and that is actually outside of our solar system. And it's associated to Orion, and we'll see that here in a bit. Okay, now let's begin to take a look at the underlying geometry that these guys have used in the ancient Assyrian or Mesopotamian tree of life. So if we take off the tree of life and the human body, uh, we're going to show some geometry that they're using here. And so I'm going to go ahead and light that up. And what you see is you see this area here following the same geometry that we see in the flower of life. And the only difference is that you see this area at the top that doesn't contain anything. This particular area that you see right here that has been colored in uh, is the outline of the tree that you see within the Assyrian tree of life. And if I put that on top of it, there we have it right there. So the geometry, if you apply the flower of life on top of it, your very top, your, uh, top vesica Pisces that you have here, associated to the head, is the winged disc. And as you can see, the geometry at the top vesica Pisces right in between that, then you have the rest of the body. And you can see how the geometry follows around the tree. We can see that the disc here is placed right in the middle of this larger ring. And if we turn on the tree of life, for example, and knock that down, we can see that the circles within the tree of life are the same size as what we see uh, as the disc that is located inside the winged disc. All this geometry is important because it tells us a story. We can see that right here we have a circle that surrounds this area. And then down here uh, we have the area that was related to the sacrum. And let me show you how the geometry fits in there. What I wanted to show you here is I wanted to show you the flower of life and how it's being used and the geometry associated with it. It shows us how they are incorporating it inside this Assyrian tree. So if we take this off, we can see this is the geometry they're actually using inside the Assyrian tree of life. Okay, so in part two, we're going to show you uh, how the human body is associated uh, on top of the Assyrian tree of life using the flower of life geometry and also the Kabbalistic tree of life just like we saw in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies. And by applying the geometry, we'll also take a look at uh, the Temple of Luxor and a relief that we see there and the computer precision similarities that we see between it and what we see on the Assyrian Tree of Life. So once again, in our next Part 2 video, we will actually see how the body is applied on top of the Assyrian Tree of Life. And this is the way to look right here, and we'll go over the details of the human body in part two.